Okay, there I am. Hello, gang. Well, it's Tuesday and I'm tired from working all day, but hopefully this uh, webinar will be uh, appropriate for your practice. And it's something that I really think that we uniquely as therapists can contribute to the milieu of a classroom um, and really looking at our knowledge of what helps folks focus and attend, how the nervous system um, is in an emotional mode or is, are they, excuse me, are they able to inhibit what is the developmental level, those kinds of things. So we're going to jump into it right now. And I want it to go forward. And it's not. Okay. Hmm. Uh, you just got to click on your screen initially. And then if you click on over at the bottom. There uh, we go. Yep. It just worked. Okay. Thank you. Um, so today what um, we're going to do is going to look at the concept and overview of self-regulation in relationship to a whole classroom. We're also going to look at wellness and mindfulness in a classroom setting. I'll throw in a bit of brain research. Um, we'll consider other factors that might set the mood in a classroom and we'll dive right into different strategies. And obviously in an hour and a half presentation, it's very hard to cover everything. So bear with me. I do believe you'll leave with some good ideas. If any of your schools or your groups would like to have me come and speak, I am still doing that, those gigs. So very, very interested. Or we can set up a webinar depending on the COVID issue as it rolls. So I love this slide. I use it in a lot of my <laughs> presentations. Professor Herman stopped when he heard that unmistakable thought, another brain had imploded. So we've all been in these classrooms where the teacher has their set goals, they have their lesson plans, they have their curriculum. Um, I don't know about you, but what I'm noticing going back to school this fall, it's very different than having gone back in the spring. And in the spring, there was a lot of concern for social emotional issues based on COVID, not having been in school, et cetera. This fall, I'm seeing a lot more issues about realizing kids have lost academics. They, are, they have regressed. There's a lot of catching up to do. And I do see this sense of hurriedness, not a lot of time for play, some definite issues with meeting standards, whether it be in kindergarten or eighth grade, there the push is there. Um, and I think it's quite interesting because we all know the higher stress level, the more chance a classroom or a kiddo could fall apart. So again, as usual, when I present, I, I view, view it as offering you a plate of appetizers. I don't know all the answers, but these are my experiences and based on research and practice um, of what could work with one of your students or could work with an entire class. Now, when you consider the least restrictive environment of the classroom, I find that I get a lot of information spending some time in those classrooms it for one form of treatment. So if I go in, I may do a full group, I may take a small group, um, and I watch how my kiddos are functioning within that context. So today I was at um, an assembly and it was fascinating to see um, who needed what accoutrement. So we had headphones, we had lap pillows, we had move and sit cushions that were just available on the bleachers. And all it took was a prompt from a educational assistant or myself. And I would say four out of five of the kids that were offered those took advantage of them and were able to make it through the assembly. So you might feel a little silly doing some of these exercises. That's okay. I don't see you and there's no worry. So let's look at self-regulation um, in the idea of how it works with the uh, idea of regulation of emotion. So the regulation of emotion responding to the stressors. 
So if a kindergarten teacher is doing foundations, which is a reading program and a writing program, if the child is not having that good experience with it, we have to see emotively if they're even going to initiate the work. Or I had a sixth grader today who's just do, begin, doing beginning algebra, and he just said, after a while, I just it just sounded like she was going blah, 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 blah. He didn't know who Charlie Brown's mother was, but I explained it to him because that's exactly what he felt. So there was shut down there because of the emotion of, I don't get this. So it's very multifaceted when you look at self-regulation because it includes inhibition, initiation, and a variation in one's behavior. And we all know it's developmental um, and it's definitely necessary to function in everyday life in a school system and outside of a school system. So I think therapists are unique in the fact that we are able to better understand the autonomic nervous system and explain this to a teacher in layman friendly ways. The, and the idea of we elicit stress we get a behavior and it isn't always a planned behavior. It may be coming directly from the nervous system in regards to the stress the child is under. And the more stress a child feels, the harder it is for him to put away the blue folder, take out the green, or to change classes and move to the next class and have everything organized. So, to me, as I expand my work within the context of the classroom, I feel that the teacher's more willing to listen to me to make these little tweaks or suggestions that we're going to talk about or initiate some ideas because she sees them work. I'll give you an example. So she was saying when they got back from lunch in a four or five, fourth and fifth grade, that they were rowdy and loud and she couldn't settle them down. I said, so what in your environment do you do to settle? Um, she goes, well, I say it's time to listen to a story thinking they'll lay down and listen after being outside and rowdy. And I know this particular class, they're very needy. Um, they were in a gymnasium last year, a uh, huge gymnasium to prevent COVID. Uh, and desks were far apart, so they haven't got a sense of community. So I said, well, what if you played some kind of a, um, a tape, a calming tape of music, people got their own individual spaces and they just kind of came to center and, and possibly have a, you know, coloring books that are appropriate for that age, um, fidgets that they could have on their own and she's implementing that now and it really has made a big difference to the transition coming back and she uses a five minute window and then they move to the story. So that's where my suggestions about the nervous system having a hard time coming together in the community because we all know that if one kid's coming in jumping and the other kid's tired, they're all dysregulated. So how do we bring them, or at least 75% of them back to regulation? So uh, Stuart Shanker's book, by the way, is quite good. And he says self-reg is a five-step method. So recognizing when a child is overstressed. So eliminate the word child and put a classroom. Identify what those stressors might be. How can we reduce the stressors? And then how can we help them become aware of what they need for themselves? Um, and then what happens from that is the hope that they will begin to develop self-regulation strategies. And so my hope is when they come in from recess or lunch, that they'll say, oh, can I help pick out the music for calming? Or do you mind if I take this spot because this is where I don't get distracted by other people? So today the teacher said, how about us all making eye pillows? And I thought that would be wonderful because the five kids I have in there definitely could stand to be able to regroup and use an eye pillow to reduce the visual incoming prior to doing some work. 
So in the last decade, the brain research has found that the capacity of the free fr prefrontal cortex to play a rational in inhibition kind of role for weighing the value of immediate reward against a long-term gain or cost is reduced when someone's stress load is excessive. So what that means is if, if the child believes, okay, if I get this done in class today, I won't ho have homework tonight. A child that's well rested, that doesn't feel a lot of stress, that um, has a decent um, food resource, um, will be able to inhibit based on development to a certain point, right? Um, however, if they're feeling extremely stressed in many different areas, think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, then they're going to say, oh, I don't care. I won't do the homework either. So I don't do it now. I'd rather just sit and play with this fidget. And so if you want to learn more about this, learn more about the hypothalamus, because that plays a role in the variety of all these systems that take in the whole body um, and determine the tide of the limbic system and how emotionally a person will react to that. So when you talk to the teacher, it's a complex mi mixture for each individual, but it's also a complex mi mixture for all these kids. So how many of us have said, maybe a movement break when you first come into class or you're making in between transitions? Because once the teacher learns how to implement things to create the transitions to occur smoothly, they may actually see that they're priming the pump to allow the child to be ready to sit down and do whatever work is presented. So let's look at the essentials right now for the nervous system to feel safe. I love to lean against the door jam in any school and just look at a classroom, whether it be an art classroom, whether it be a gymnasium, whether it be a regular classroom for very different grades. I look around because the aha moment when I created the drive through menus was that idea <laughs> of teachers teach from posters. So I look at the posters. I look now at are there places that routine and ritual is posted for those kids that need that visual cue? Does it feel safe and comfortable to enter that room? Um, it, is there an opportunity? opportunity throughout the schedule in that environment daily to simmer some of the information they're learning, rejuvenate, so they're rebooting their system, or spend some alone time? And is there adequate time for social sharing, purposeful work, and successes in dealing with failure? So even though a teacher will say to me, yeah, I've got the whole schedule on the board, he, he keeps asking me what's next and I keep sending him to the board. Well, this has been going on now. We're, back, we're in school a little over six weeks. So I, my suggestion today was that his educational assistant write the schedule on a three by five card and have it at his desk for constant reference. Because if he, he feels that he has to get up and go look at that board all the time, we don't know what's causing him to not do that for whatever reason. It might be he feels weird getting up from his table where the other kids are, or maybe he can't read or writing. We don't know. And I love this quote from Mildred Ross. It hung over my desk for many years. Um, whatever is novel alerts, whatever is fast excites, whatever is routine or familiar soothes and composes, and whatever is slow re relaxes. Now, we know this as therapists, especially when we're treating kids one-to-one. -one. This also, as you know, sets the tone for looking at a classroom and what happens during any given day. I'll never forget one day being in a classroom and um, I was there. I had, I think, about four kids out of the 20 on caseload. And the teacher was a very charismatic person and 
they changed their voice intonations. They, you know, did a lot of interesting things to get kids' attention. They were very engaging. But the one thing that this person did is if a child um, was being successful, they would go up and down the aisle and every once in a while they just reach out and touch their head, like give them a little pat on the head. Well, it worked for, you know, 95%. They didn't take it in a strange way, but that one kiddo that had sensory sensitivity pretty much felt he was being attacked. And so I explained, I took, that was a perfect point of performance time to explain to the teacher that he was he was unaware of it, but this is why the reaction was. The kid wasn't just trying to uh, be a behavioral issue. He truly was reacting from a sensory point of view. So while I'm in a classroom, we're having these sidewalk chats at, at in real time, if that makes sense. So I'm giving information that will last, I'm hoping, beyond into the week when I'm not there until the following week. So let's dive in right now and just understand the basics of breathing. Think about some of the kids you have that are mouth breathers or they have disabilities that cause them to have very shallow breathing or kids that have a lot of issues with sinuses um, and and problems with their own nose hygiene. And now guess what we've added are the masks. So when we start to think about it, um, the idea of taking some deep breaths in may feel very strange, but they, it is one of the best ways to level the nervous system. I, you know, depend upon the age group I'm with, I'll talk about refocusing with high schoolers, um, probably middle school, let's say let's reboot um, or recharge. Um, some kids, I, I call it, let's center ourselves. So um, when we do this, we're actually creating a physiological response, as you all know. But the, the thing is, we don't often share that with the kids. So when we talk about your heart is going to slow down if you extend your exhalations longer. There's a nerve in your body called the vagus nerve. And when you do that deep breathing, it gets the message to slow your heart, let your muscles relax. And when that happens, the rhythm of your heart slows and your blood pressure decreases. And I got those all from uh, Goldie Hawn's The Mind Up curriculum. She was, uh, I think Scholastic bought her out and she has some wonderful ideas of teaching kids about their brains and being able to understand their own bodies. And so the beginning of this year, I had my fourth and fifth graders actually feel their pulse and find their pulse and run in place and then take their pulse and write it down do some deep breathing, then take their pulse again. So let's do a couple together. So just put your hands on your belly to start, and you're just gonna do an inhale and hold it at the top, and then exhale. Now let's do the exhale with actually making a shush sound, S-H-H-H-H, -H -H, to extend the exhale longer. So I'm going to have you breathe in to a count of one, two, three, four. We'll hold it at the top and we're going to exhale to five. So here we go. Breathe in, one, two, three, four. Hold it at the top. Exhale, shh, one, two, three, four, five. Inhale, one, two, three, four. Exhale, five, four, three, two, one. Last one. Inhale, one, two, three, four. 
exhale. Five, four, three, two, one. So you just lowered your blood pressure. Good for you. So when you look at my drive through menus in the calming and stress busting, that was belly brain waves, essentially. Now, you don't have to be laying down when you have a younger child. Um, yoga kids suggest that you put like a stuffed animal on their belly. I, my older kids, I have them put a pencil on their belly. Um, but as you begin to teach them, you will see some of the inhaling and exhaling is completely out of rhythm. They don't understand it. And so as you get that extra tactile of them touching their belly or even putting hand on chest and belly, that can help teach the regulation. Now, there's another breath that's really quite fun to do. And so what you're going to do, I'm going to try to put my webcam on so you can see me for this one. All right, here we go. So I'm sitting, you can do it standing. You're gonna put your arms out to your side so you get your wingspan. And you're going to take some sniffs as if you're inflating a balloon. So here we go. Deflate. Inflate. Deflate. Inflate. And deflate. Now, when I did this with elementary kids uh, last week, um, we were in a room where we were on yoga mats and they deflated, hitting the ground. So they were, you know, seeking out that rough and tumble, but they immediately came back up to do the five in a row. So they were getting those sensory needs met there. So in our unique perspective that I alluded to earlier, um, the teacher may buy into uh, more of a collaborative approach as you model and they participate. And truly, when you think about a, a teacher, and when I got involved in inclusion way back in 94, I, I worked at a school in Stratum, New Hampshire, and they were totally inclusive and they let me be totally inclusive as an OT. But what I learned so much was what their perspective was of what they needed to get done, how they expected it to get done, and as I modeled different ways of changing the environment, uh, being able to um, get a little more motion before they sat down for circle time, teaching some simple sign language to prevent them from blurting, uh, doing pop-up spelling where they had to pop up for the vowels. As we began to work more collaboratively, collaboratively together and I understood curriculum better, they were much more willing to allow me in and then carry my suggestions on for the week. So teachers know, we know what dysregulation looks like. So you see this child when the transition comes. All right, can you turn in your homework? Oh, well, I know I put it in my backpack somewhere. or I had a kiddo today. I mean, he entered the room as if he was being blown by the nor'easter coming up the East Coast and jumped and then looked to see who was paying attention. Very, very disruptive. Um, there's also a disconnect between the goal and the response. So the idea of if we're going to sit down and you're observing them take a time math test, the mad minute. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but it causes a lot of stress in kids. The idea of being able to realize this is only going to last a minute. I'm going to do what I can and what I know. But kids that get stressed will say, oh, I'm not doing it at all. I'm going to do lousy. I'm bad in math. And so there's a disconnect between really what the whole idea of doing it is. 
also inappropriate behavior under instruction. This is the kid that's trying to avoid for whatever reason. Is it, are they whispering to you essentially saying, I can't do this unless I get a movement break. I can't sit this long. You've already asked me to sit 30 minutes in circle and now I gotta go back and, and sit for another 45 minutes and do independent work. Um, or the inability to tolerate the sensations of distress to meet a need. So doing an unpreferred task, there's that volitional quality that is truly developmental and then kids with a diagnosis of ADHD, that volitional quality is very, very um, much delayed, 30% younger than their chronological age. So if you've got a 10-year-old who has to stick with something to finish it, you're really needing to scaffold as if they were seven, if they have this diagnosis. So those kind of tidbits, that come often from a therapist's point of view are tidbits that often a teacher does not know. And that's where the special specialist comes and works with the regular ed teacher to see that it's not just the four kids you have on your caseload in that classroom, but everyone's nervous system is at different levels and how can we help? Think about the, um, idea of Diana Henry, you know, and the popcorn that she used to have kids do the jump, 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 right? And that was to help give that sensory input to help with being able to feed the system to allow them to sit longer and stronger. And in this day and age, in schools, I don't know about you, this is what's going on with teachers, with kids, with parents, with therapists, and ancillary staff in general. So these are things that you probably already do, I'm hoping, but this, I always come in and say to the teacher, what's, what's the hardest thing right now for you? Okay, so he might, she might say, they're too hyper, they're not calming down. So let's look at your routines and rituals. So I might give them a typical day handout What's the toughest time of day? How about, how about times during the day where there's low demand? So you take one group of kids and give the others something to do that's not going to be stressful so you can spend time with four or five others. Um, if the music is 60 beats a minute in the classroom or less, that's going to be more calming. If you put on music that's irregular in beat, or higher than 60 beats a minute, you're actually revving the engine. Changing your voice tone, having a variety of places to sit, rocking chairs, ball chairs, having TheraBand in the classroom in a fidget corner, a foot roller, dimming the lights, counting as you do the breathing, as I just demonstrated. Maybe a getaway spot that's not a timeout or go, go think about what you did and come back, but a place to chill. I know they're talking about Zen zones and things like that in some classrooms. The deep breathing, the chair push-ups that are the heavy work. I have one teacher that she calls it the mantra of the week. So last week it was, I can do it. <laughs> it's like the little engine that could, but guess what? It was in sixth grade. So she, she introduced it and said, we're gonna just start having something for the week where, where we say it out loud every morning, I can do this, I can do this. And, it, and that helps the teachers and the kids recognize that's one of the goals, I can. And they will be helped by those teachers. Then all the good stuff of the chewing of the straws, something crunchy for snack, headphones, earplugs, and I won't go down the list. But these things often, and um, it saddens me to think that sometimes um, teachers don't realize that they can have those things in their classroom. You don't need a prescription from an OT to have a beanbag chair or a move and sit cushion. Um, and you don't want to give everyone pencil grips, you know, that kind of thing. You want to have a classroom that's equipped for a variety of nervous systems.
Teacher says these kids are not alert enough, alert enough to teach. So the therapist might say, how much novelty? Are you changing your voice? Are you making it exciting? Um, are you using a time timer to create a little stress? Not a lot, but just a little, because we know with no stress that there's a little apathy that can occur. Um, brighten the lights a little more. Loud and lively music. Changing the intonation of your voice. Snapping, clapping movement breaks. The fidget toys that are exciting, like the, the poppers right now. Um, Taking brain breaks, when you see the blurting increase, the, the idea of kids getting distracted, the noise level in the room goes up, that is like somebody waving a white flag, give us a brain break because we're now getting more dysregulated. And so as you go down through this, um, these are just ideas. And feel free to share these with your teachers if you're finding that they don't really quite know what to add and what might work. Um, the thing is, is that you may think, well, wait a minute, I got, I got to treat this kid. I, you know, I can't be teaching the teacher what to do. This is my argument, and you know, I'm 43 years into this, and I'd say 37, well, maybe 38 of those years now has all been school-based. So when you think about this, you can, if you make an impact on what your kid is going to experience in that classroom all week when you're not there, and it's going to be therapeutic to help them be able to attend, focus, and work, then you are giving them a bigger gift than just pulling them out. Now, I'm not saying you don't do pull out. I do pull out too. But that's where you do the intricate coaching, the detail kind of work. But when you're in the classroom, you're actually seeing what they're experiencing all week. So now we're going to try some of um, the new exercises in your handouts. These aren't published. Feel free to use them. Um, I particularly um, really like them uh, because I find they're working with an older group that they like to use them, not that the others don't do the calming and stress busters, but these are just additions since I have become a mindful schools um, teacher. So let's take out your handout and we're gonna try a couple of them. I'll put on my webcam again. Okay, so the first one we're gonna try is called slider breath. And what you're gonna do is take your two fingers Bring them up to your opposite shoulder and extend your arm. I'm going to sit back a little bit here. Okay, so this can be done in a classroom seated. Doesn't have to be a big deal of getting up. So you take, take your fingers like so, you extend your arm, and what you want to do is you're going to breathe in as you slide and then breathe out as you return. In, out. Now I'll have kids watch their fingers. Two more on this side. All right, other side. Now I have a couple kids that like to do palm up. That doesn't bother me. It's, there's no technique that has to be just so. But I prefer the palm down in my case. I'm crossing across the midline, taking those two fingers, breathing in, sliding on down. So for a younger kid, you might say, you know, out on the playground, you see the slide? You can create one with your own arm. Let's imagine you're on the top of the slide. You're going to breathe in before you slide down. 
and then breathe out as you go. We other one up. We and so on. Now, if you have a severely handicapped kid, you're going to probably do a hand over hand with them and you will be regulating your their nervous system. And what I mean by that is this. We know that when someone's nervous system is in dysregulation, another person who's calm and grounded can actually connect to that person by sitting across from them, even hand in hand, and do breathing together. So the reflection of the mirror neurons will come and you will be able to get a kid to regroup. So um, I, I did this, I think in January, Dan Siegel's um, hand model of the brain talks about when you're feeling dysregulated, the most primitive part of your brain is your limbic system. If something makes you feel unsafe, angry, worried, scared, you can flip your lid and then the limbic system is just gone rogue. It's like a reptile. And all your organizers and planners and everything in your frontal lobe just flips and it disconnects. And I explain that to kids. And that's why we learn these different techniques. And just like the drive through menus, like the calming and stress busting, actually, um, I didn't mention it in the beginning. There, If you end up wanting to purchase those today, um, Therapro is going to give you 20% off those. But when you do these exercises, the education needs to come with them with a cognitive overlay. Like, you, I'm going to show you six different exercises. You might not like just one. But if you like it, then that's the one that's going to work for you. And so you encourage them to almost create their own toolbox. And then the teacher has all the tools. And then she or he will be able to say, OK, what in this poster or what has, has Mrs. Bowen Irish taught you that works? And so they will be able to then have those communication feelings. All right, the next one that I really love, uh, and I learned it um, when I was at Kripalo, and it's called Heart Rock. Um, so you're going to stand because that makes it easier for you. You can do it sitting. Um, but what I want you to do is cross your arms across your chest like so. And what I'd like you to do is just sway side to side. So you're going to inhale. Exhale. Inhale two. Exhale. Inhale three. Exhale. Inhale four. Exhale. Inhale five. Exhale. So I was in a classroom and it was a, a one two, and this. <laughs> One little muffin said that um, it reminds me of my mother rocking my baby sister. So then what we did is we held elbow to elbow and we inhale one, exhale two. So we were rocking the baby and then someone broke into the song of Rockabye Baby, which is pretty scary falling out of trees and such. But I thought that was kind of cool for the kids to cross that border. And then one of my favorites is called um, push, pull, and pause. So you're gonna put your hands in front of you like so. So you're going to breathe in, pulling your hands in and hold it and then push. So pull in. Pause and push. Pull in. Push. And you can build that. If you see a kid, and I find my younger kids, their rate and pace is a little much. So I might say, pull in one. Push out two. Pull in one. Push out three. Pull in Halloween night. 
push out candy wrappers. <laughs> you know, get silly with that too uh, for the younger version to be able to have them do that. As you go up through the grades, I think sometimes kids think um, everyone's looking at them. And so that may be difficult to sell it to them. But to have this as a handout, I have no problem sharing my work. I mean, long as it's for teaching purposes and nobody's going to publish it, I'm fine with that. So pass them out, have the kids experiment, and then have them give you some ideas of, of what might work for them. So there's no method that has to be done so strictly. It's looser because everyone's nervous system is different. So let's review a few from the drive-through menus that I particularly find successful. Or I think all of them actually are, but the reality is these are more popular, if that makes sense. So I'm going to take off the glasses. All right, so the first one is it's all in your head. So you're going to take your two fingers and roll the sides. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Fingertips together, pull across your forehead. One, two, it can flow down past your eyes. Three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. And then finally, many children really like this. Um, I find it, I kind of do it in my bathroom. I don't really do it in public. I had one kid say to me, my mother would never do that to her hair. It's just kind of rubbing your head. One, two, three on different sides. I had one child um, who likes, he liked to do it flat. So giving him input, himself input like that. So there's all kinds of variations and your hair doesn't look so great after, but that's fine. <laughs> all right. Now, the other one that I really like um, is gathering the goodies. So you put your arms out like so, and you think about something that pleases you, a day off, gather that goodie in. Now let's add some breath. Bring your arms out, breathe in. Think of something you're looking forward to. Arms out. Think of um, a wonderful memory. So as you begin to gather the goodies, you can have kids name that, playing with my best friend, getting my driver's license, you know, whatever's on their mind, getting an A on my science project, that is the way and the connection for the teacher to learn more individual things. Because really, when you think about us, we have a caseload with singular kids. We don't have a herd, they have a herd. So it's very hot, much harder to get them to know individually and they don't want a Stepford classroom where everybody does the same thing. So these kinds of exercises can really help shape and understand um, with giving a little more information about what they need. And the final one is slow motion. And there really is no method to this. It's wherever you decide to move your arms, um, and you just want them to mirror. So here we go. Breathe in and breathe out. Mirror everything I do. So you get the idea. Now you can do that with a whole class, but if you think the environment is too overwhelming and you'll get inattention, you can pair kids up and then you walk around. 
and and give them ideas. Um, I today I played um, Twister with some kids, um, and what I noticed, um, and the teacher was there, and she and I were both amazed. Is we didn't use a spinner, so three kids were on a mat, and three kids were off the mat, and there were other activities going on. So Joey could say to Henry, right hand on red. And then Henry and Sarah and Anne would put their right hand on red. Then the next kid, Eve, would say, left foot on green. And then they would have to follow. But what we noticed was the ones that were giving the directions were actually having a harder time and getting more frustrated because they were really having to be able to give a direction when they've been taking directions. <laughs> so the ones that were getting the directions were just going, where's my right hand and left hand? They didn't have much to worry about, but those giving the directions. And she said, wow, I've never talk, thought about having them give one another directions. So there we go. There's a little infiltration there. And we know that's not a calming activity, but what that does is it lets the teacher understand what might be causing stress if, if a child doesn't understand how to even say what, how to do something to another kiddo. All right, I'm gonna say goodbye here again. So again, here's a bunch of pictures. You all know the, the routine and the rigor of, of how to, um, outfit that classroom, the move and sit cushions, the rock and chairs, the chairs with arms. I have a classroom now that the teacher has a mini tramp and it has a bar on it so they can go and take a mini tramp break. Um, the tea stools are okay, but actually those new ones, which I don't have a picture of, that look like an hourglass, they're all solid and they can rock on those. Ho hokey, I think, no. I don't know if it's called hokey or pokey, it's O-K-K-I, but they seem to be replacing the tea stools in our school. The Zuma chair at the top right, um, I was on a committee uh, talking about just environmental stuff in the school and they were talking about replacing chairs and I had read about this that a physical therapist had designed it and so they did order some and now we have them throughout our school in in all of our classrooms so it's a great chair for those kids that rock or need a little movement so there there's a classroom influencer then we all know that if we're uncomfortable sitting in a certain posture to get work done it's unbearable so how many times have you moved listening to me tonight um, and how many times have you adjusted your posture to be able to focus and attend? So, of course, there's other tools out there, you know, doing yoga poses in the classroom. Um, many teachers, and I don't know if you've noticed that, but if they put on something like Go Noodle, they they find that they can go over to their desk and do a little stuff. So what happens there is, is a disconnect between the calm teacher's nervous system and just giving kids something to do on their own. So when we look at it, if the child is given um, yoga poses to do on a screen in front of the classroom and there's not a human model, the chances of 100% participation go down. So the human model provides a way to intonate the voice, to talk to them about, oh, you put your hand on your hip, you put your other hand in the air, or however they're describing it. They're not getting that information because that uh, video is not going to intuit what the child needs. So these are just other tools and it's about experimenting what works for the teacher and what works for the kids in the classrooms you're in. One of my kindergarten teachers for her centers, because she wants them to all know basic yoga moves, is she puts five kids in the center, she introduces five yoga poses a week. So you get to the center as a five-year-old, you look at down dog, 
you teach it to the other kids in the in the group. So in other words, no, there's not it's not your adult yoga. They just say we got to do this with our body. They do it. Then the next one teaches tree. The next one might teach table. Then they have to sit down and they have to draw themselves in their favorite of the five poses. So now we're getting body image in there, an organization of drawing. And then they have to write the name of the pose on their drawing. So there's copying and all of that. I thought that was a wonderful center activity. And then the props for the classroom, which we've talked about, that frequent movement breaks. So well-modulated classroom with executive places, decent music, therapy, using that with the whole group. So when you bring these new ideas for props in, don't be afraid. Like in the, in the calming and stress busting, there's actually a bonus card of stretchy band activities, and there's two stretchy bands in there. Because I now will buy a roll from Therapro of um, stretchy bands. I don't do a real uh, resistive one. I do kind of a light medium. And then I cut them into about, depending on the age, right around 24 to 36 inches. 36, obviously, for older kids. And then I do stretchy bands with the whole class. And they really, really enjoy it. And then what we do is we will overlap prior to sit down. So if they're going to do a spelling test, the teacher will yell out some of the no excuse words like wish. So you, they know how to hold the band W and they pull I and they pull S, pull H, pull wish. Now who can do it in a sentence? Someone will say, I wish I was at home. Okay, let's say the whole sentence. I pull, wish, pull, and you know the, the drill. So that's, that's kind of cool. So when we, we continue with the prop idea, there's also like this feeling of acknowledging in general that 100% of attention isn't realistic. And we're going to talk a little bit more toward the end about that. Multi-sensory approach, these are the ways that therapists work. Um, understanding how to balance and create a predictable routine with a little bit of novelty. And so if the teacher feels like, wow, you shot half of the, the lane of light. So I have one classroom right now where there's two light lanes of, of incand, nah, um, oh, I can't even say what the kind of fluorescent lights. And when you walk in there, you feel like you're, going to be blinded. So I always shut off a bank of lights when I walk in to do a group. She said to me, what's that about? I, so I looked at the class and I said, how many of you can hear those lights? So the 22 in the classroom, six kids raised their hands. She went, what? And so we all learned together that sometimes having the lights out really does work. So here's some practical ideas for classroom management. So if you choose to use the drive through menus, it's a prepackaged deal. This is an infomercial. I'm tooting my horn because I had this feeling in 2004 and five, I was handwriting these menus out and hanging them in classrooms in Stratum School. And I was finding teachers going, oh, these are really working with the kids. They want to do it. And I created them because a kid, no matter their ability, they could point to a picture they liked. They could point, if they could read, they could point to the word that they liked of, of what they were doing. And now we've expanded them that there's actual games to play, there's stretchy bands and some. So these are things to begin to start to think about. It may be a very economic tool to get that movement in that really is gonna make a difference in the classroom. Now here's a mandala project. So in one of my schools, I work very closely with the art teacher because she was going to be doing shapes to complement the geometric studies in math up through the grades. So we talked about the different mandalas, the different ability levels developmentally, and then there were um, these mini art shows where she put up different mandalas that different kids had done. So 
often now in our area where it's a getaway, we'll have mandalas in a little uh, folder that if kids need to get away, they can work on their mandala. They have their name on it and it just stays in the folder till it's done. And we're talking a getaway with a time timer for five minutes just to get away and then come back and regroup. So we all know these, the alert program and the zones of regulation. Where I start to get anxious is when I start to notice that the language around the zones especially is about being green. And we all know if you reflect on your day from the moment you get out of bed this morning to right now, we have fluctuated. Probably we haven't gone to red, although if you have, bless your bones for even showing up tonight. The idea of kids can fluctuate throughout the day. It's not that green, green is the best one and I'm so happy you're in green and oh dear, look at Sarah's in yellow, that bugs me. And so I really think the full blown teaching of that is a wonderful way of creating self-awareness but I add to that of the idea of, okay, you're in blue. Where do you feel that with, in your body? And kids are now starting to tell me, okay, I feel heavy. I feel like I can't move. And so we talk about that bodily sensation. And when you go to red, what's happening with your body? Oh, my fists get tight. Now, this all comes from interoception with mindfulness. And so you just do this in front of the teacher, talk to the kids about their own bodies, talk about the zones and all the different things that go into it. And then in the classroom, the fact that you're allowed to go to different zones, what helps you regroup? Oh, maybe we need a movement break as a class. Maybe I need just a little break. And so they begin to build their own toolbox of self-awareness and self-reg. This is that Mind Up program by Goldie Hawn. It comes with a poster about your brain. The three publications she's done are broken down and I think it's um, K through two, three through five, and six through eight. But the six through eight actually can be used all the way through high school. But I found, I've heard Scholastic is coming out with another edition of this. I've yet to see it. But they did purchase it from her. And then when you start thinking about teaching a teacher just really simple things, flicking lights when it's time to be quiet, or take a breathing break to suggest to a parent for a bedtime ritual. So, you know, we, we, this slide added that because I gave this seminar to, um, to parents about trying to understand what they do at home and what, how it's linked to the classroom. Ringing a chime, ringing a triangle, call a response, dun, 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 dun. You know, so when you start to look at kids and what they need, we all need that that they understand what is going on throughout the day. How am I feeling throughout the day? And what is happening to my body at those different times? How many of your kids have come in, especially those young ones that are dropped to daycare very early, and they just keep asking, when is snack? And so when you start to realize that that hierarchy of need, they might have had a snack at 5 a.m. on the way to the babysitter and they haven't eaten since then. And so those kinds of silly things are things to know, right? So if a parent is having a problem with a kid trying to get to the dinner table, they just need to silently guide them there. And a teacher can silently guide a child back to their desk without making it a big deal. Starting circle hours with the same poem or reading. Having that word action, inhibition, that's my mission. That was a younger class that had that. 
So this is another one that I really like is the incredible five point scale. It's an old book, but a really good one. And it, you use it with kids individually, but I've used it for a whole class. And we were talking about um, where you get turbulence and dysregulation and they talked about airplanes. So this is the one we came up with. When we're at a five, we're focused on a task. We're able to inhibit, no blurting. We're taking care of business and flying straight. At four, we can do our work and may need reminders to get started or focus. Do we need a break before sitting? We may need to ask for help problem solve when we're at a three for breaking the task up into little bits. Maybe a time timer would help. At two, we're starting to sputter and wing it. The whole class may need to reset, regroup, or recharge. Maybe a change of environment for a brain break. So I have a teacher that just has them run around the building. And if we're at a one, it may seem too loud, too chaotic, too hurried. People are impulsive and blurting and moving fast. We are not always listening. Hey, let's prevent a nosedive. So it's a way of having them kind of look at the whole classroom environment on a one to five scale. And that book I've used, I mean, mine is threadbare right now. I've used it for so many years and I use it a lot one-on-one -on -one and now in a classroom. And of course the zones of regulation, there's some wonderful activities involved in that. I know many schools are adopting it and I'm so pleased that, that they are recognizing that we're teaching self-reg and emotional control. And I also love the idea of the, the problems associated with colors. Having those common language for kids and teachers and staff and families can decrease the stress levels in those classrooms because we're all talking the same. So before we close, we're going to um, do um, a visualization called Go Play in Your Mind, which I usually close most of my seminars with because I feel like this is something that has always worked with the entire classroom. There's nothing nicer than seeing all these heads on a desk or the whole, if it's an older group, their eyes closed or gaze is averted. One thing to be aware is to never demand that kids close their eyes because there's so much trauma in our world that they may feel traumatized if they keep their eyes closed. So you can say, avert your eyes, look at the ground. But I generally, with younger kids, will say, just put your head on your desk and have a rest. So for right now, we're only going to take a couple minutes and I um, will lead you. So get settled in to wherever you're seated. Let's breathe in. One, two, three, four. Breathe out. Five, four, three, two, one. I want you to imagine yourself doing something you absolutely love to do. It could be a memory of something you've done in the past. It could be something you do every day. And just spend one single minute doing it in your mind. Create pictures, create the scene. You can even bring sensory into it. What do you smell? What do you hear? What do you see? And I'll call you in from playing in one minute. Okay, come on back to me. Just notice how you feel. Did it work? Were you thinking other thoughts? Did you know the average person thinks 70,000 thoughts a day? 
And if it was hard to get away, I would challenge you to try to do that and get curious about being able to not clear your mind, but keep returning back to your breathing. And I love this quote by Maya Angelou, people will forget what you said, they'll forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And since I've been getting into more and more classrooms, there's nothing more satisfying than having good working relationships in schools, not feeling like the outsider of the old days of driving to 10 schools and not really knowing anyone's name except your caseload kids. So I would urge you to consider being an influence using your skills in the way that you were trained to. Um, and I do thank you for coming. I'm going to take um, questions next. And if anyone is interested in joining a mindfulness group for therapists, I'm running. I'm running one now in person, but I would consider doing some online work. And I've also done some coaching around being a school-based therapist for some therapists. So if you're interested, feel free to contact me, and we can talk. Um, but right now, I will take some questions. All Allison, right. Are we all set? We are. We survived the storm together here. Almost, almost. Knock on wood, right? All yeah, right. we're almost there. <laughs> how do we find out how many beats per minute in music? Oh, great question. Um, from what I understand is that you, you look at... Um, Different types of music will have classifications for how many beats per minute. You also can Google it and and understand. I'm sure there's some kind of scientific thing, but to me, I kind of do it intuitively. You know, as a yoga teacher, I'm certainly not going to put on um, Surf in USA when we're doing Shavasana. You know, so you know, I I do the quieter stuff. But the other part to think about is you ever walked in a classroom to figure out a um, why certain kids aren't paying attention. Some need headphones because they really can't work to music. And I would have been one of them years ago. Um, there, uh, I would give you a name. I mean, he still has published stuff and that's who I learned from. He passed away uh, a month ago. His name was Enrique Coleman. Um, and if you try to Google him, I think you may be able to, um, get some more information on that. Okay, great. So we have many thank yous. Uh, this is awesome. Thank you. Great information. I appreciate taking the time. Um, lots of thank yous. All right. You guys love this webinar. Thanks for all the positive feedback. Uh, another question. What was the name of the cards you are showing that we can buy on Theraprop? Um, uh, the drive through menus for calming and stress busting. And that link will be in the follow-up webinar too, so you guys can find them nice and easy. Um, next question. Do you have any parameters that you use for how often to use suspended equipment? Oh, wow. <laughs> that came out of nowhere. Um, wow. Oh, gosh. I'm such an eclectic person and as a therapist. Um, I have this feeling when I work with certain kids, and I do have access to suspended equipment um, in a room, my own little room, my hovel outside the gym. Um, I, I use it for often um, kids that are dysregulated that need more than what we can offer in a classroom. The cuddle swing to me um, has really helped a lot with certain kids for dysregulation. And the other part that's kind of I've evolved with is I actually do math facts and spelling while they're in the cuddle swing. <laughs> and and then they they can tell me they want one single spin. So we're using it more of a quiet space. We're doing 
Now, when I get them in, on the tire or hammock swing, then we're more rigorous upper strength. And I, I guess that's the best way of answering it, if that makes sense. All right, next question. How many minutes do you do the slide exercise for? I do about five breaths per arm. Okay, I worked for high schools. Many of them are defensive, protective, and don't want to stand out. How do you recommend that I bring these skills into the classroom or individually? Okay, high school's tough. All right, so I work in a high school too. I, wor I work at one school in New Hampshire that has 90 kids, and that's K through eighth grade. And then I work at a school for kids that are that have diagnoses that prevent them from accessing public school and they're usually in social emotional areas so i do tomorrow morning i'll be doing two high school groups and then individual work with mindfulness and yoga so in my experience is the biggest thing that a high school kid needs is a connection that you better understand them they i always call it turning building the bridge between being a kid and being a young adult. And that resonates with them. And this resonates more. I say, so does anyone treat you like a kid, but then they expect you to act like an adult? And immediately, da, 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 and they start talking. The other thing that I find, um, I think small groups of three or four work a lot better than a large classroom to start until they get to know and trust you because they don't want you to call them out in a classroom if they're not participating. The other part that I do too is let's say I have a new student tomorrow because this is a floating enrollment in this high school because they might act out in, in their public school and then have to move <laughs> quickly. And so they come in tomorrow, they're brand new. And I might just say, okay, I've been working with these guys for about six weeks. You can sit and watch and just see what you like. And so everyone has their own space with their own chair or yoga mat. And I will, I give them visuals. So I might you know, retype, so I only have two or three exercises on. I say, just read these, see what you like, or I'll read them out loud. Let's try a few and then we'll play with it. Or I'll play some music and I'll say, you know, where do you feel that in your body? Um, one thing to really think about is Mindful Schools has a wealth of information and they have very reasonable um introductory courses um, and it might be worth your while to fool around with the idea of just taking a few courses in mindfulness because what I find is it kind of completes the circle for me from sensory integration to prefrontal cortex stuff for just the idea of how do we begin to integrate and the getting quiet and feeling calm and relaxed really resonates with the teenager. Awesome. All right. I have a kid that end up not being a match for the super grounding activities initially. Do you have a go-to media motor in classroom activities that you like? Oh, I have a lot of them. Uh, one of my favorites comes from the drive through men menus, um, and it's uh, called Tie It in a Bow. So I'll stand up and show you real quick, and then you can experience it and feel it. This works, I'd say, 95% of the time to get them back calm. So arm up, arm out, fingers down, fingers up, turn in, pull. We're gonna take all of our energy and tie it in a bow. Other arm up and out, fingers down, fingers up, turn in, pull. Both arms up, breathe in, and out, fingers down, fingers up, turn in, pull. I had a I had a little kid the other day tell me, can we do it twice so we're really double nodding? <laughs> 
Oh, dear. Uh, Craig, any tips for a child who appears triggered by school in general? For example, someone who melts down at random times throughout the day, not just during certain specials or tasks with goals of pickup uh, from parents. Different sensory environments have been explored, quiet versus loud, slow versus fast, pace, etc. Wow. When a child is not functioning in any part uh, of the day optimally, that's a real flag. Um, you know, if it's unpredictable, it does make you wonder if that's trauma-based. So you can't track what might be igniting it. It might go back to trauma. I hope they're getting a psychologist involved um, because the, it sounds like if you're not getting any happy time um, or any time of pr purposeful work, then they they might need to dig it a bit deeper. All right. What uh, what's your recommendation when it comes to frequency of whole class movement or sensory breaks for K through third grade classrooms and fourth through sixth grade classrooms? Okay, great question. All right. So in my little OT world, my ideal is um, I treat one in class, one out of class. So when I when you're first on my caseload, and this is, you know, 75% of the time, 80% of the time, the other 20% we know is crazy. It might just be, you know, one time a week for 30 minutes alone, just depending upon what. But I go into classrooms once a week and I do motor activities with all those groups. So K1 today, <laughs> we um, we balanced, uh, they look like paper plates, but they're different colors on our heads. And I played, um, I sang the song, you're creepy and you're kooky, mysterious and spooky. You're all together gooky. You're the kindergartners, you know. And they paraded around the hallway trying to balance on the head. Then I cut out little pumpkins just out of orange tissue paper. They had to throw them in the air and try to catch them. Then they had to throw them in the air and try to kick them. Um, so there's the movement break. So then the teacher, after we finished that, we did some breathing. Um, we we actually did sliders, and um, then she directed them to do a sit down writing activity. And then I worked the room, primarily focusing on my kiddos. In fourth grade, uh, we played. I don't know if you've ever heard of the game Quirkle. So I had two Quirkle games. So I split the kids in half. I had 21 kids. So I made sure that my four that were in that group were in my group and the teacher took the other four. And the object of the game was not to play it the way you would really around a table, but it was everyone got five quirkle pieces. We started with one and then they watched visually where they could put theirs in. And we just kept going around until they were all gone. Now, I have a couple kids in there with pretty severe reduced motor scores for visual perception, and that's why I chose to do it. But then I have kids for organization, and I'd, I'd say, okay, let's stop. How many different places could you put that Quirkle square? And then they'd have to figure out, because they would just see one, and that would be their only go-to. Um, so they were on the floor, on their bellies. Um, and then in in the like one, two classes, I might do movements from the drive through menus of attention and strength because they still like them. They still love that movement. They love things like um, being able to jump and hop and follow, you know, we do a milkshake one. I also have body challenge exercises that combine curriculum. So I think you have to kind of figure who's on your caseload. They take priority. What are their needs? And whatever you choose for any of these exercises, you know they're not going to hurt any other child. They're developmentally good because they're just going to build the upper um, strength, coordination, those kinds of things. And you're priming the pump to access the classroom activity. 
and that's how you work closer with the teacher. This is so hard for me to do because I can't see any of your faces. I don't know if you're shaking your head, she's crazy, or if you're shaking your head up and down, that's good. <laughs> I'm getting a ton of thank yous coming through, so I okay. think we're we're in a good spot. <laughs> good, good. I, it's just I'm finding it really hard to be disconnected and just online without, you know, having the person-to-person -person stuff. 